Good everyone, and uh, welcome back to uh, the council meeting. And I'd particularly like to acknowledge and uh, welcome uh, Chris Finneson and Tamari Toe, uh, both of them here to uh, assist us in our deliberations on the Otakaro Aden River Corridor Code Governance Establishment Committee. I wanted to acknowledge um, uh, Tamari Toe with his. Uh, incredible um, knowledge and experience, but I think as the upoko of Naituhuriri uh, to be able to bring that uh, knowledge and experience to the table um, as we work through some of these issues, it has been um, an absolute delight to be able to uh, work with him. So thank you very much. I just wanted to acknowledge you um, for that. And I also uh, wanted to acknowledge how wonderful it is to work with a former parliamentary colleague, uh, not on the same side of the House, of course, um, at the time, uh, but uh, the Honourable Chris Finlayson, with your depth and breadth of experience um, on issues relating to co-governance, both uh, from a, uh, a legal um, point of view, but also uh, from a ministerial point of view, I just think that uh, you've been able to bring a wealth of experience to the table and uh, the introduction was made by Tamari To um, because I know that the relationship with both Naitahu and Naituhuriri goes back a very long way. So welcome, uh, welcome, welcome to, um, to our uh, council meeting today. I would like to begin by handing over to uh, the General Manager, Mary Richardson, uh, who has been um, helping to uh, develop the, um, the Otakaro Aden River Corridor Co-Governance Establishment Committee, an important uh, milestone in our, in our city's history. So over to you, um, Mary Richardson. Um, I just want to, as we get started, as well as acknowledging uh, to report Mighty Toe and Chris Finlinson, Honourable Chris Finlinson, as the Mayor has done, also acknowledge uh, Chrissy Williams, Hayley Galetu, and Peter Beck, who I think are um, uh, listening on live stream and has been part of contributing to the development of these terms of reference too. Um, I'm going to take the paper as read uh, and just noting that this is actually simply enacting a previous decision, which was to, um, the previous decision was to establish a co-governance and it was just to report back with some terms of reference uh, so it could be formally established. I'd now like to hand over first to Chris, uh, Honourable Chris Simonson to actually provide just that context again around co-governance and how it's applied across the country and local and central government. And then uh, um, Tamari Toe can speak to the concept of tōpuni. Um, and uh, then that, that'll be it, and I'll we'll, uh, turn back to you, Madam Mayor. So, uh, first, uh, Honourable Chris Wilson. Well, kia ora, and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak. It's great to see you again, Mayor. Uh, and I remind you, as you said, we were on the opposite sides, but it is absolutely true. Your adversaries are on the other side, your enemies are behind you. Uh, and that's certainly the case for me. But moving right along, um, I uh, th think the uh, discussion today is actually very timely because co-governance seems to be the word of the moment. And um, I'm sure that the mayor and I have been down this road before. We can see the seeds of massive public debate uh, starting to emerge as uh, people uh, start talking about co-governance without necessarily knowing what co-governance is. So what I thought I would do is say from my point of view uh, what I believe co-governance to be, how the term developed um, when I was a minister picking up from what Michael Cullen had done in his time as minister for treaty negotiations, and then how we got some form around it. Um, the concept of co-governance responds to the wish of many iwi to have greater participation in the management of the environment. And in my time, many of the grievances against the Crown by iwi and hapu uh, was caused by the fact that the Crown uh, excluded iwi and hapu 
from any say in the management of natural resources, which are very much part of who they are uh, and what they stand for. As you well know, whenever one goes on to a marae and is welcomed on a marae, the welcoming speaker will begin by reference to his awa or his maunga. Uh, and so that connection with the environment is so very important and so very strong. And Tamayri can talk about that further. I'm, I'm looking at it from the point of view of a former Crown official. So Michael Cullen had begun some work on the Waikato River as part of the second tranche of the settlement with Waikato Tainui, and the Waikato River arrangements were finalised by me when I became a minister but to bring in not only Waikato Tainui, but Tuwharitoa, Te Arawa, Rokawa, and then Maniapoto through the Waipa. And then in the course of the time I was a minister, other types of uh, co-governance regimes were established. In about 2010, the then Minister of Local Government, Rodney Hyde, uh, said that given the number of settlements underway, it would be helpful to establish some guidelines as to how we would um, approach co-governance. And then um, over the next little period, uh, he and I developed some guidelines and these are the sorts of things that when we were designing a co-governance regime were regarded as important. The strength and the nature of the association of the iwi to the resource, the nature of the grievance in relation to the resource, the number of iwi involved, the state of the resource, the nature and extent of public and private interests, the aspirations of the crown and iwi, uh, in relation to the resource, very importantly, the need for well-designed institutions and the durability of any arrangements. There's no point setting these up if they're only going to last a few years. And so they are the sorts of factors that we took into account in developing co-governance regimes. And broadly, there are two kinds of co-governance regimes. There's the advisory board, and there's the stronger joint management arrangement. And around the country, uh, you might come to the Wairau River or the Manawatu River. The boards set up there were more in the nature of advisory boards, whereas other types of arrangement, given the history and the intensity of the relationship with the resource, meant that there were stronger co-governance regimes. So that is basically how co-governance started in this country uh, in relation to natural resources. Uh, and that's why um, I've been uh, talking to your council uh, over the last few months about uh, the t responding to the aspirations uh, of uh, Naitu Ahuriri uh, and the, 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 the broader community of Christchurch. How can one design a body that is durable, that lasts for generations, that addresses the, the aspirations of, of both communities, uh, all for the benefit uh, of the river and the uh, surrounding corridor. So that's, that's the, the way in which that issue has uh, um, emerged. And now, of course, we're having a much broader debate, but I don't need to go there because this what is being designed and talked about in, if you like, uh, co-governance terms is right within uh, the, the sort of thing that I did in relation to Awa and Maunga and other natural resources in my time as a minister. Sorry, I forgot to yeah. um, I forgot to switch on my microphone, and uh, I was um, busy saying thank you very much uh, for that um, presentation. It was very, very clear. Um, and now I'd like to invite um, Te Māori to um, speak to uh, Tōpōni. I think it is that uh, you are going to 
address um, and uh, you know but 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 feel free to um, you know speak to the to the broader issue as 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 Chris has done as well. Thank you. Thanks, Leanne. Kia ora, everyone. Um, code governance is kind of working at the moment. We've just put a statement on our Facebook Council about the occupation down on the river. So we've just cleared the way for what needs to happen out there. Um, look, th there is the Tōpuni. A Tōpuni is when Rangatira place their cloak over something to secure it and to preserve it. That's the idea, and that's the way we see the Avon River Corridor, because I think it does need to be preserved. There's a couple of reasons from our view why this is important, um, specific, and then I'll go broad. The specific issue is, we think, um, essentially, the Avon River Corridor was a mahinga kai place for our people. I do think it needs to be restored because I, I think the next big issue facing us collectively is climate change and where our stormwater is going and how we're going to secure that place for future generations. We just need to be aware of what's coming in the future. Um, the second thing is just in terms of the leadership of Christchurch City Council and Christchurch leadership, it's always managed to have a clear head on the issues that Chris spoke about. My, my particular view is um, we know change is coming and it's best that we're in the front position leading as opposed to following what the Crown will dictate. So we know the Crown, sorry, we know the tribe has done the Teretanga via legislation. The Crown has cooperated. What I think is important on this one is how we cooperate in the South Island to benefit the South Island on that, where the councils and local government can leverage the tribe's authority to function and to govern in the South Island. And I think we need a South Island vision of where we're going as opposed to be driven by Crown direction. So I see this as a front step for that where we're ahead of the Crown in these areas. And really, from my view, the um, Avon River Corridor is a good way because it binds us towards cooperation. That's what it does. And that's what the Tōpuni does. We have to cooperate. And the idea of Ngaitahu going off with absolute sovereignty, doing what it um, wants, simply it's more difficult than worth imagining and i think the co-governance thing compels us to engage with the Christchurch city council but it gives um citizens in Christchurch the capacity to frame their own future as an experience for the south island and what i mean by that is clearly the tribe can lay down its tikanga on the avon river corridor but what's better is that we do it with the Christchurch public. So there's joint ownership by the community in this um, Tonga for us all. Gabe keeps on telling me I make things complicated, but what I do see is that it's an opportunity for both groups to leverage the capacity that we have to create it, to create our own future in Christchurch and for the South Island rather than being directed by Crown policy legislation. This way I can put it. Thanks, Leanne. Kia ora, thank you. Mary, would you? So um, uh, we're happy to hand back uh, to you, um, Leah, for any questions that may have. As I said, this, uh, this um, issue has been debated and it has been a prior decision has been made and this is just simply enacting that prior decision uh, by presenting some terms of reference. Well, I think the, the, the question that I have is that um, the, the concept of um, having a co-governance establishment committee, uh, I, I guess just in terms of your experience, Chris, uh, do you think that that um, has particular significance in terms of um, creating the capacity, you know, across councils, recognising that there's an election coming up, um, across councils to um, to sort of enable and facilitate the framework for um, that enduring future that you spoke about. Um, I, I'd really like to hear your comments on that. I think it's very wise to establish such a committee because my experience of co-governance regimes, and I use, for example, Te Unoroa Atohe, 
90 mile beach and you might want to talk to John Carter about it at some stage because he's now mayor of the far north is it does take some time to set these up uh, and so I really do think it's a question of making haste slowly laying the foundations getting everything right because there can be capacity issues on the iwi side I'm not saying it is here but there can be generally and so just making sure that everything is bedded and well I think is a very smart way to go and I think on this occasion there's the added advantage that the you know the land ownership hasn't transitioned um, yeah. as yet so um, yeah. there is time for us to do that uh, I created a phrase after the earthquakes which was um, take your time as quickly as you can <laughs> and that was yeah, to thanks. really pick up that sense of urgency but the need for the space to work through um, what are deeply complicated issues and in this case may result in, a, in an act of parliament so um, thank you very much for that. Has anyone else got any questions? This is a huge advantage to, to speak to uh, such a high standing constitutional lawyer that I don't think people will want to see this opportunity lost. Um, I've got Jake McClellan, Yanni Johansson and Jimmy Chen. Hey, just thinking about the, the, the skill set required for those three members um, that, that are appointed by the, by the two chairs and noting that that's kind of slightly different to the Naitahu um, representatives, what kind of skill set uh, would, would these people have? For us or... uh, so I, I did see you uh, leaning forward, Honourable uh, Chris. So do, do you want to answer that and then I can yeah, I, think, I think it's very important that at least one or two of them have a really good understanding of council processes and can work with council because if you get people in there who you know are only dealing with it from uh, an environmental or conservation point of view there's always a danger of adversarialism and adopting a hey we're all in this together kind of approach is very important and therefore people who understand the needs of council um, the financial and other obligations of council to the wider community are going to be, I think, essential at this preliminary stage. Cool. Thank um, you. I would have uh, no, nothing more to add to this, but the, expect, uh, the expectation is that these people have to have a wide, uh, view of the wide community, a wider community perspective and be able to bring that to the table, but also be very um, looking at long-term strategic uh, views and the whole of the planning and the policy around this so not just focusing on the operational aspects of it. So no. it's longer to yeah. understand that and that's almost a given, but I, I just wanted to emphasize that other factor, which I believe is important for the durability and success of the organization. Great. Uh, thank you. I've got, um, uh, sorry, I can't tell which was first. Yanni, uh, Yanni Jimmy, and Phil Major. Thank you. Um, I'm not. I'm not quite sure who's the best um, to answer this question, but it, it just seems a bit confusing when I look at the co-governance establishment committee um, versus the kind of the ongoing co-governance committee. And I just wondered, like, when you read through the report, in terms of reference, um, is is this a two-stage process where the establishment committee will set up the go the co-governance committee and then that that then goes forward or is it one and the same uh, no it is a two-stage process because what the um this is about uh putting something in place now so it can be in place but one of the key responsibilities of this group is to actually identify the best arrangements for that enduring um co-governance model and that may differ to the to the committee that's set up but it's about um, what is the best type of framework? Was it a legislative framework through an act of parliament? Was it a trust document? What would be the key operation, the key objectives of that? What would be the operation principles of it? So it would be intended 
that this uh, establishment committee would bring back a recommendation to council that would be the and um, uh, mana whenua, and then that would be the next step forward, whatever uh, to uh, sort of enact that um, structure that uh, was agreed. And, and what's the time frame for it coming back? Like when would we be in a position to receive that? that well, next um, stage? the advice would be relatively quick. Uh, if it was actually a uh, local act of parliament, that would take longer to actually um, put in place, but the advice could come back relatively quickly, but actually the implementation of that advice may take a little longer. So why would we want the establishment committee providing strategic direction, leadership, decision-making at the moment ahead of setting up the enduring co-governance entity? Because it's a chance to actually trial the operations and see how it works um, before we put something and embed it in legislation that we actually then find isn't workable and isn't functional. That's uh, which I think is uh, the a point that um, Chris Finlinson said is actually this is a good opportunity to actually see what works and what doesn't before we lock it into legislation or lock it into a trust document. Because one, once it's locked in to either of those, it's quite difficult to change. Yeah, and that's my, my experience. I think it's a very good point Mary has made. Uh, there are one or two organisations that were set up under, you know, for treaty settlements where we went from go to woe in one foul swoop. Um, I, th in, a, in an ideal world, I think what Mary is proposing is the smarter way to go. The, the ultimate structure may not be too far different, but it's just making sure that everything's in place before, take for example, if, if it was a local bill before you went to uh, one of the MPs to promote it. Yeah, I, I guess I understand that from that point of view. I guess what would concern me is that the powers are so wide that the establishment committee could make some irreversible decisions in the meantime before the permanent co-governance structures got established? So I, I hope not, Yanni. The, um, I, I see this as a tentative working thing. Um, and I just, as kind of a response to Jake, Jake's point, um, the skill set we imagine, I have a bunch of skill sets that I think are important, but I just we just need to be scouting the land first on to, to see how we're going to make the appropriate appointments at a governance level for this. The, um, two skills I see, and my authority is not protective about this, will clearly be um, environmental science and environmental engineering and how I'm going to do this. And my authority is not protective about this. Oh. But it's, um, there may be a larger skill set in the wider community, and we've got a particular set of skills, but they may be better. So it's just a matter of in my view, making sure we get the initial body established well, um, but I certainly wouldn't see anything making this establishment body making clear statements, at, which are definitive. And just a final question from me is, um, in accepting that um, it's a co-governance arrangement, um, but just under five, um, and in terms of the council, would we not could we have a step where we would make recommendations on what the three other committee members were or, or should be? Like, I'm not quite sure why council would be, um, as, as a given it's a committee of council, why we would be excluded from making a, a recommendation of the people that were going to go on in terms of that item number five. So you actually have to appoint them, Councillor Johansson. So this is asking the chairs to identify those people and they will be come, come back to be formally appointed by council as a All right, as that, legislation requires. Right. Okay. Thank you. So why do you need five? Is, is that just a chair's recommendation? The chair, I'm not quite sure what the point of five is then if it, and why that's, that's not explicit. That's making it clear who's actually going to identify these people to bring back to you, that it's not, oh, okay. it's not a staff going away and coming back with recommendations, it's sure. the two chairs coming back. Do you, think it, 
would be useful just in five to just add what you've said, like just to make sure that it's really clear. Yeah, no, we'll do that, Yanni. We'll just change cool. the wording to Thanks. make that crystal clear. Um, mm -hmm. I've got Jimmy Chen and then Phil Major. Yeah, two questions. The first one I'd like to ask the priest, uh, Honorable. Regarding you, men you mentioned earlier, co-governance, you know, based on past experience, they have two parts. One is advisory board. The other one is stronger to join the management. I just want to know, uh, but because uh, all these uh, uh, the committee, they consider two parts. One part from the EV, the uh, Lili, then they, they part of the EV, they were responsible for how to uh, select or elect those members. But regarding to this one, uh, I, I, yeah, also because I review the terms of reference, it looks like no any the the term, the duration, how, how many years you know, this term, how to replace those, the new one. And also based on your experience, those the board member or the, those the committee member is through the election process or through the selection process or laminated directly by the Crown. Yeah, well, no one, well, no, no one would be uh, involved by the, uh, on the part of the Crown here. Um, in my experience, um, I think it's ve very important to spend some time working out who would be the appropriate representatives uh, who can do the job that's required of them. Uh, and um, I'm just, you asked a question about the difference between well, advisory boards and joint management boards. Advisory boards are, if you like, one step further back from real involvement in the resource. Um, and that occurs where the interest is perhaps not as profound um, as I see it here. I think the Joint Management Board is the better precedent for you to adopt here uh, because of the nature of the resource, uh, both the, the river and, as the Mayor said, the land that's coming back. Uh, and the intensity of the relationship. Now, I hope I've answered your questions, but if I haven't, uh, feel free to ask me a supplementary one. Okay, yeah. So, which one is because I'm concerned the local democracy, because uh, you are aware, at the moment, the council structure, all the committee members, majority, maybe 95% is from the elected uh, council member, but 5% is only few, is we have pull up with the same or qualified skilled expert the, the, as a joiner, uh, as a committee member. But this one, what is your point of view? Is through the uh, local democracy from elect member or is it from the skill experience, you know, those, the, the, those as a member, which one is, is better? Oh, no, I understand exactly what you're saying. And that is why there needs to be strong local representation, but equally the extent of the historic relationship between the iwi or hapu and the local resource um, is a very important factor to take into account okay thank you and uh, sec yeah. okay second i would like to ask mary particular for the uh, delegation here uh, the, the this uh, committee they have too many functions one is council dedicated to make decisions for land uses and uh, activities. The other one is make financial decisions. I just want to know whether this committee meeting, after meeting is, uh, uh, they need to present the list uh, meeting minutes to the uh, council meeting or not? Uh, yes, this is like any of your committees. So this is a committee of council. So the minutes would have to come to council. Um, the other thing is that it is only has delegated authority to spend the budget that it has. So that will be up to the council to actually delegate it the budget. It can't, can't, it's limited by what council provides to it. It hasn't got an unlimited budget that it can spend. Yeah, but so based on your the reply, the council just uh, the, to receive the information, am I right? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay, thank just, you. There are things that are outside the committee's delegation, they would recommend them up to council. Okay, thank you. That's my question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Phil Major. Hi, this is uh, 
probably a question for Mary. Um, and, uh, and excuse me if I haven't seen it in there, but I've, I've looked long and hard. What, what happens to that um, group called TTK? Does that vanish and this sort of takes over from it? Or where are we at with that? Um, at the moment, the intent is to establish the committee and then the, um, it could be decided whether the, the committee want a subcommittee that functions and picks up some of TTK uh, activities or whether it actually can absorb all those activities itself. But it will be once the committee's established and we'll decide whether it needs a, uh, a subcommittee or whether those functions can be approved by the committee itself. Beautiful, thank you. Yeah, we extended the um, operation of that group um, and, and, it, and I, I note, uh, you know, that it does cover uh, other elements of land that was red zoned in the Port Hills. And, um, and so, uh, you know, but I mean, the focus has been significantly on the OARC. I think that, uh, that, that there is likely to be a recommendation. So we've just extended its operation in order to um, facilitate decisions that are being, well, recommendations and and advice that they're giving at the moment, um, uh, and and but we, the, the 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 co-governance group will come back to council um, as part of a you know it, it being a committee of council with recommendations in that regard as well. Is that is that a fair summary, Mary? Yep. 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 That's great. Okay. Um, so that seems to be all the um, questions. Oh, except that I will, because because I'm now conflicted really on one of them, which is to appoint me as one of the co-chairs. Um, I, and I, I note that you've um, referenced me as uh, Leanne Dalzell uh, by name rather than by position. Um, and that's simply to allow for the uh, ability to transition across the electoral um, cycle um, but recognising that it will be the incoming uh, council that will be um, in a position to, uh, to, to make an adjustment um, uh, to that. But I, I just, you know, I, I think that having that sense of continuity, I mean, I personally will work as hard as I can uh, if, if council entrusts me to this role to ensuring that um, we pull out all the stops to come back with recommendations before the elections um, so that there is at least some sense of the tabling of a way forward, even if it's not a decision that this council um, makes. Uh, you know, it, 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 that's, that's certainly what I would um, want to commit to the, to, to the role. Um, but I have to say that I'm now conflicted on, on number three, um, and, uh, and and I guess the um, uh, I, I would be conflicted on the ultimate decision, which is number one, which is that the council will appoint the co-governance establishment committee when it, um, uh, uh, when it comes time to um, make that the, the members of the committee. That yeah. So at the moment we're appointing the committee, we need one person for that purpose, that one person is me, and um, uh, and then uh, then the balance come back to council for a sign off, and I would be conflicted on that um, if I'm if I'm agreed. Is, is that, I, I've, I've managed to confuse, yeah, confuse that's myself. Correct. And we have made an, amend, an amendment to number five to pick up Councillor Johansson's question. Yeah. Can I just check though? Because if it's just appointing to a committee and we normally um, uh, vote on, you know, even if we're appointed to committees and things, we will vote on that at the same time. I wouldn't think you'd be conflicted because it's not a director thing, it's just a council committee. We, yep. we all have mm -hmm. always done that. Okay, all right. Um, Yeah, I, I, it's appointing me as a as um, as a one of the chairs. I I, I don't know. Anyway, I, I would like to conflict myself on on item three then. Um, so, um, but uh, but I'm you know happy to um, to accept that if um, if well I would like the council to accept that because it 
allows for a smooth process um, as we proceed. So um, that seems to be all of the questions and we've got uh, some wording which says request that the chairs identify and recommend to council three other members to be appointed to the committee. So that um, we've got Te uh, Runanga O Tuhuriri to identify four members including a co-chair and then the chairs identify and recommend to council three other members to be appointed to the committee. Um, and as I say, this is the establishment committee and it will have a series of recommendations uh, for um, uh, possibly tabled on this side of the election. Um, that would be my hope, um, and uh, but determined by the by the incoming council for the for the establishment um, of the um, of the Otakaro Avon River Corridor co-governance committee if that's what um, if that's the limitation of our thoughts in terms of what it might be called <laughs> all right uh, so I will um, I will oh well actually if I can't I can't move it if I um, conflict myself so I'm not going to conflict myself I'm going to move it and um, do I have a seconder um, Mike Davidson right so um, well, uh, look, I'll just open it up for debate. Um, I actually haven't prepared anything um, specifically for, uh, for today, uh, but I just wanted to say that this is an incredible milestone. It's a step along the way um, of a journey that began actually at 4.35 a.m. on the 4th of September 2010, a day that's etched in my memory, um, being woken up uh, out of a deep sleep um, in, in Bexley <laughs> on that day uh, and, and then having to be confronted with the reality of the um, impact of the February earthquake um, and of course all of the other ones that, that occurred at the time. And then, uh, you know, the announcement, I think it was, we were the, in the first group to be um, red zoned, as it became known, uh, and uh, of made an offer um, that we couldn't refuse, uh, not because it was such a good offer, but because there was no other offer made available. And this was the experience of, you know, sort of seven and a half thousand uh, property owners right across the Otakaro Aden River corridor. Hugely challenging experience for people. It was a mechanism for retreat. Um, it didn't feel very managed, but it was a, an important step, and it was an important step for the city too, because dealing with the reality of sea level rise and dealing with the the, the reality of the um, of the flood risk that would have been created in that environment, uh, it would have been too huge for the city to take on. Uh, being able to think about the future now, though, as a legacy for the city, and I want to acknowledge all the work that's been done, uh, Regenerate Christchurch with the Regeneration Plan, uh, but also all of the community groups that have emerged, um, the Otakaro Avon River Corridor, Greening the Red Zone, you know, all of those different groups that have, um, sorry, the um, Avon group, the um, Avon um, Otakaro Network, that the work that you've done, the, the incredible um, strength that you've shown and the ability to engage the wider community in this conversation about the future um, and thinking about the ecology of the area and the opportunity to restore um, mana, te mana o te wai, the, the, the mana of the, of the um, Otakaro River, you know, just the, the incredible opportunities, the, the stormwater um, cleaning up that's occurring in, in, in uh, wetlands that are being developed in the Horseshoe Lake area. Um, you know, just all of those opportunities, they are huge. And uh, so that's why I think that it's such an important opportunity to be able to think about that in the context of uh, co-governance, which invites us to listen to the voices um, of the river, but also to listen to the voices of mana whenua, um, and their uh, knowledge and experience of Mahinga Kai uh, and, and all that this environment has meant. Um, Otakaro means a uh, place of play. I didn't know that before I was the Mayor of Christchurch. And, uh, 
again through a learning how how significant um, these water bodies are and our role in, in protecting them for future generations for our children and their children after them. Um, it is so, so vital that we come together in order to think about the future of this incredible place. Um, there is a history that sits in uh, behind the, well, many histories that sit in behind Otakaro um, and its surrounding areas. And uh, those stories, uh, they date back prior to European settlement, but also the post-European settlement stories are now important and also reflected in the decisions that were made uh, where people who used to live there lost uh, their homes and lost uh, the communities that they, um, in many instances, had grown up with. And so this is about um, restoring something really special to this environment for the future. This is just the establishment phase, but I think it's a really important opportunity for us to think uh, with great optimism about what the future of this area will offer um, our people, our, our city, uh, and actually our nation when we think about some of the challenges that we all have to face uh, with uh, changes to our environment in the future. So uh, again, an incredibly important opportunity for us all. So um, thank you everyone for all of the work that you've done and I too would like to acknowledge Chrissy Williams and Peter Beck who I missed out in terms of acknowledging at the start. Um, who else would like to speak to this? Andrew yeah, Turner. Just, um, do we absent ourselves now? Yes, certainly. Thank you very much for your um, contribution. Thank you. Thank you. Good everyone. Andrew. Thank you very much indeed. Now, um, reading this report, um, it tells the, the history of how we've got to where we've got to, and it's largely a report around the, the mechanisms for establishing a committee. Um, but there's one line in this report that really jumped out to me, and it's the first line of um, paragraph 2.1. The Otakaro Avon River Corridor represents an extraordinary opportunity for the city and the region. And even that sentence quite possibly underestimates the opportunity that's in front of us here. Um, this is extraordinary. Um, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. It's a legacy. It's unique. It's wonderful. It's groundbreaking. It's amazing. It's an opportunity to work together. It's an opportunity to work together differently. It's an opportunity for education. And it's an opportunity for, re for restoration, both physically and spiritually. And what we've got in front of us in this paper this afternoon is an opportunity to begin to realize all of the amazing things that this piece of land offers, some of which have already been the subject of a lot of discussion and a lot of thought, some of which may not even have been imagined yet. Um, so I'm delighted to, to be able to reflect on the journey that we've been on with the community in partnership and in conversations with NITAHU. Um, this is an excellent opportunity to work together in co-governance. I'm delighted to see this piece of work get to the point where we can make this decision today. And I'm very supportive of the recommendations that are in front of us. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Mike. Uh, Mike Davidson. Uh, thank you. Um, well, this this is actually a really good, a great occasion. Um, I felt like just reading the introduction to the terms of of reference as a, as a debate. It was actually that that good. Um, but but I think actually the, the right thing to do is um, a naitau a fakatoki uh, uh, moka uri a muri akine um, for us and our children that follow. Alright. It seems to be everyone. So um, on that basis, for those who are supportive of the motion, please um, uh, put up your hand. Um, opposed? Appears to be none. Thank you, that's carried unanimously. Thank you very much. Yeah, I feel like clapping too. <laughs> oh, that, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Right.